recently read an article from DVM 360, New Veterinary College Possibly Heading to Kentucky. The link to this article is in the script, and I will have a lot of supporting information on the Patreon of where I got my statistics for this episode. So, Murray State University is studying the feasibility of creating a School of Veterinary Medicine in Kentucky. One of the reasons they are doing this is they are concerned about the statewide shortage of veterinary professionals. Their goal is to get future veterinarians to come to school there and then stay to help Kentucky. While admirable, I wanted to dive into this a little bit more. At first glance, I would say this is a bad idea, but let's see if I say that at the end of the discussion. There were three overall points I wanted to address. First, I wanted to address if bringing students into a local school would be helpful to supplying vets to that region. This has been tried before at Lincoln Memorial University. One of their goals was to get students into Appalachia that would then stay in Appalachia where there is a shortage of veterinarians. At the time of this episode, I teach LMU students during their senior rotations. So I contacted LMU and asked if I could see what states their students were coming from and if they had data on what states graduated students from their institution were now practicing in. I was a little disappointed in their response. I thought if they were succeeding in keeping their students in Appalachia, they would be singing it from our rather old mountaintops. Instead, they said they don't share that information with individuals and they share that information with other groups like the Kentucky Department of Agriculture. I reached out to the Kentucky Department of Agriculture and they got me all the information they had on the subject. What I found was interesting. By LMU's math, 67% of their students from 2018 to 2021 are practicing within 25 miles of their hometown. When I crunched the numbers from Kentucky specifically, it seemed 78% of students from Kentucky stayed in Kentucky within 25 miles of their hometown, which is good and supports Murray State's thoughts on getting more vets in Kentucky. As an in-state school, they would attract more Kentucky residents with in-state tuition rates. And as the numbers prove, as vet students, we tend to go back to near our hometown upon graduation. I did. Those are the numbers from LMU. They had anywhere from 5 to 21 students in a class from the 2018 to 2025 classes, and their class size ranges from 87 to 124. Their school is actually in Tennessee, but it is right on the border of Virginia, Tennessee, and Kentucky. So they likely would be attracting local people, and thus, because of their location, they should get students into Appalachia. People like going home. Well, we all like our mother's cooking, after all. However, I'm not sure where all the LMU students come from. I know they go home, but for most students, it's home near veterinary shortage regions. I'm curious about this because of the students I teach, some of them are returning to Appalachia or Kentucky because they lived there to begin with. But those students, when I asked, weren't certain that the goal was being met at getting the bulk of the students to come back to Kentucky or Appalachia. Likely because there are out-of-state students and they're going back to their hometowns and their mother's cooking. Since LMU didn't share other numbers with me or Kentucky about what states the students come from, we'll just have to guess at that. However, I did look at new graduates coming from Auburn College of Veterinary Medicine and how many came back to Kentucky. Those numbers were a little different. Only 57% of 2023 Kentucky residents came back to practice in Kentucky. Overall, still these numbers in my mind support that if Murray State adds a vet school, young graduates will likely want to practice in Kentucky where many of them will be coming from. But there is just more than getting vet students into the state. How much will it cost to make a vet school? I wrote a paper in undergrad and miraculously found it for this episode. I will post it on the Patreon for people if they want to read it, along with the other supporting statistics and script for this episode. Anyway, 
I had written a letter to a congressman asking for them to continue funding to veterinary students who go to out-of-state schools, Auburn and Tuskegee, allowing those students to get in-state tuition. Fast forward from when I wrote that paper to now and, well, it worked out well for me. But I also mentioned about the median family income and that was then in Kentucky about $8,500 behind the national median family income and 19% of people in Kentucky lived below the poverty line. Kentucky is still not rich. Now we are about $10,000 behind the national median family income, but only about 16% live in poverty. And Murray State is a state-funded institution, so Murray will have to get money from somewhere, and my guess would be that would be tax dollars and tuition. My and other Kentucky tax dollars, at least for a large portion. The letter to my congressman also discussed making a veterinary school in Kentucky as that was talked about during the time I wrote the letter. One of the previous additions to veterinary school institutions was Tufts University, which required four buildings to be built and cost about $62 million in the 1970s. Today, the price of constructing the same buildings could now be half a billion dollars. That doesn't cover finding staff, paying staff, and then buying all those fancy equipment things that need to be purchased for educating the next generation of veterinarians. At the time of the letter, I recommended just keeping Kentucky funding of in-state tuition to out-of-state vet schools. One of my questions now is if money was funneled towards a new veterinary school, would money be funneled away from supporting students who go to Auburn or Tuskegee? So if we lose or decrease the number of vets that come back to the state from the institutions we work with now, we would have to make up the deficit with that many more from Murray State University. With the potential funding price that taxpayers would have to give and the concerns of losing avenues that already bring vets back into the state, this would make me very hesitant to invest in a veterinary school at Murray State as a taxpayer or a veterinarian. But let's say Murray State does get a veterinary school. What are these students who leave home to become vets going to come back to? I'm afraid it's going to be much like the hobbits coming back to the Shire after the One Ring was destroyed. And I'm talking the book version, not the Peter Jackson version. Everyone's math can be a bit different depending on which numbers, so I have where I got my numbers from on the Patreon in a spreadsheet. All these numbers were as close to 2023 as I could get. But in general, for pets and animals, you spend money on them when you have disposable income. Pets and animals are a luxury. You pay for food and rent first. What is the median household income in Kentucky? $55,000. How much money do you need to survive in Kentucky? Depending on how many kids you have and how many people are working in the household, I got an average of $51,000. Single person needs $32,000 to survive and two adults and one child, which children often have pets associated with them, need $70,000 to survive. So again, I took some averages as there are too many family situations to quite account for. So anyway, $51,000 is what you need to survive and the average household brings in 55000 That's not a lot of wiggle room. Let's look a little closer. Kentucky is wonderful if you take a Kentucky Studies class because the teacher will give you a blank map which has 120 counties on it. I am happy to say at one time I could fill out all of those 120 counties names on that map. I can't anymore, but I can find a zygomatic arch so for now I'll call that more important. Of those 120 counties, only 9 or 8% of the counties have average household incomes over 55,000. My county's median household income is 44,000. Do my clients have appropriate income? I am in the Golden Triangle of Kentucky, which many listeners may think Kentucky is a landlocked Bermuda Triangle, but it's 
usually not. The Golden Triangle, and I did learn this from my Kentucky Studies class, is the land between Northern Kentucky, Louisville, and Lexington. It is linked by interstates, and that's where the money flows in the state, along those highways. I know it to be true. I watch it from a distance, since my county is kind of floating in the middle of that triangle and in a no-man's land. But it, like so many other counties, doesn't have the financial stability needed to really maintain a veterinary practice. I could not survive on my county alone. Most of Kentucky, like my county, is not in the Golden Triangle, or by the Golden Triangle. Two counties next to me do have that disposable income, but some counties in Kentucky are landlocked by destitution. Are veterinary practices really able to survive like that? As I'm writing this, I'm listening to some clients in the lobby. They are explaining how to get preventatives for their dog. The dog is shared between three different households because neither one household can afford the dog. Which, follow me on this, because I'm going to get into some numbers. But according to an AVMA study, a companion animal clinic in general has 2.1 vets to staff it. A mixed animal clinic, 1.3. Food animal vets, one vet per practice. That's nationwide. If you take the average of that, it's 1.5 vets per practice. That AVMA study also showed that Kentucky had somewhere between 100 to 500 clinics with less than 20 employees and 10 to 50 vet clinics with greater than 20 employees. There are 2,600 licensed vets in Kentucky according to the Board of Veterinary Medicine. I imagine those clinics with greater than 20 employees are mostly all in that golden triangle I mentioned. Why do I say that? Because in general, I pull clients from four counties. Two of those counties are in the golden triangle, two are not. My practice is in one of those counties that are not in that golden triangle. I looked at my expenses from 2018 to 2022. If I take the profit I made from people in both those counties, there is never a year that my expenses were covered with just the income from the clients from the counties with less median income. I would need to pull from at least three counties of lower median income to cover my expenses. I feel my clinic now needs 1.3 vets. I don't need another full-time vet. I need someone to cover the time I'm off and see some overflow. So what I'm thinking is in more rural Kentucky, we aren't seeing gigantic greater than 20 staff vet clinics because of a lower population base and lower median income. They have to pull from a wider geographic area to generate a profitable practice. Now, if you are a vet in a rural area, Kentucky or otherwise, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this line of thinking. Shoot me an email if you'd like to theveterinarypodcast at gmail.com. So my question is, will we get vet students who can graduate and go out to areas where no one has money to spend on their pets and animals? Will we be able to pay students enough to pay back their student loans? Will they go to practices that can pay for qualified support staff? A point I make time and time again is there isn't a lack of veterinarians, there's a lack of places for veterinarians. Sure, there are plenty of animals to see, but if no one has money to spend on the animals, what good is it to vets? Will these vets go to areas below the poverty line to work, even if it is their hometown? Vets have to eat too. And sure, I know there are practices out there in these areas of lower income, and they are surviving. But I do wonder, could they be more efficient, and would it be a slightly easier job if there was the money and education that people just didn't come in with parvo cases, but came in for vaccines? If there were jobs where assistants could be trained as technicians to be able to triage and handle more so one veterinarian could see twice as many animals in a day, how much more efficient would a practice be? I would make an argument most vet hospitals need more technicians and support staff versus more vets. And no, I don't have an answer how to make Kentucky not poor, but I think everyone is ignoring that side of things because it's harder to fix. There needs to be more discussions rather than a quick answer of making more vets for a vet shortage. 
I know that seems like the obvious answer. We don't have enough vets. Let's make more vets. But where will they go? I think we like saying let's make more vets because it's an easy answer. What we really need to focus on is the economy and making vets valuable. Vets are pretty innovative creatures. Give us a strong support staff and a small number of vets will service a large number of animals. But we need money to hire educated staff and to educate motivated staff. We need money to have incentive for vets to work and for vets to have money, their clients need money. So to answer that article, yeah, the school will bring more vets that want to come to Kentucky, but may destroy avenues that vets already use to get to the state and burden an already burdened state with an increased tax burden. After all that, these vets could come out and only 9 of 120 counties in Kentucky have a living wage with disposable income to spend on animals. What are vets really going back to? Because does my clinic need another vet? Yes and no. The problem at my clinic is I cannot afford another vet. While I think Murray State is right on some points, for example, if they get Kentucky students, the students will migrate back to their home region to do work, I have to ask, will these students who come out being the new generation of veterinarians, will they be able to run a business? Will the state be able to support one in-state vet school and seats at two vet schools out of state? Is it worth risking losing those vet schools? Because those students will come back too without the increased investment. So let me know what you think about some of this information. Shoot me an email because this isn't just about a vet school. It's about why we have a vet shortage. I'm Dr. Nathan. Thanks for listening. I hope our discussions are valuable to you and aid in giving perspective. If you want to contact us, please reach out to theveterinarypodcast at gmail.com. You can find a complete list of the podcast episodes on SoundCloud. If you find this information helpful and want more content, please join our Patreon, patreon.com slash theveterinarypodcast. And don't forget to follow our Facebook page, facebook.com slash theveterinarypodcast. As always, thanks for listening, and I hope this information is helpful to you. If you do find it helpful, please like it, share it, so other people may find it helpful as well.